Greetings. I'm Rob Redden. I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ in uh, the beautiful on the beautiful coast of California, the Central Coast. And I've been bringing these lessons to you for over two years now. And uh, I appreciate those who, that have uh, stuck with me and uh, listened to these broadcasts because I spend a lot of time preparing these lessons because I think there are subjects that are vital to our understanding if we are to please the Lord. So today, I'm returning back to my subject of first principles. I'm going to talk about the church. What is the church? I know everybody has their own perception and their own ideas about the word church and what it really is. So today, this lesson, what is the church, is intended to be informative and educational. You know, the responsibilities of the preacher and Christian teacher is to teach. Matthew 28 and 20, after people are baptized, they are to be taught everything that the Lord has taught them. And it's to be encouraging and edifying. In 1 Thessalonians 3.2, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. <clears throat> and he says to those brethren, we sent Timothy, our brother and fellow worker, in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. So we're going to spend some time trying to see the biblical concept of the church and not just simply what people assume it to be. In the first place, before Jesus died, he said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church. That promise to build his church was built upon the foundation of the lordship of Jesus. That confession of Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so, this makes the church important to God, and we hope to you and me as well. Not to mention that the New Testament uses the word church, ecclesia is the Greek word, over a hundred times. You know, when I discover that a word is only used once, it sparks my interest. But if there is a word that is important to God that he would record it over a hundred times, it should do more than perk my interest. I should dig deep and see how that word is employed and used throughout the scriptures. You know, you can't even hardly open the New Testament without a verse being directly or indirectly referring to the church. Of all the books in the New Testament, you will discover some inference or reference to the church. Most scholars believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written to churches. And certainly most of the epistles of the New Testament were written to churches. Only a few of them, such as Philemon, First and Second Timothy, and Titus, and a couple of epistles of John, were written to individuals, but it definitely always related to church. Take, for example, the words of Galatians 6.10. Paul wrote to the church and said, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to the household of faith. Surely this applies to each individual, but just as verse 6 states that one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him, may be done either individually or through the church. So verse 10 implies the work of the church as well as the individual's private life. 
And so this is very common in the New Testament, where it seems to be a personal reference to somebody, but it's inclusive of the whole church. But before we can really appreciate the church in the New Testament, we need to have a working knowledge of it. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he was going to build it, correct? In Acts 20 and 28, Paul said to those elders at Ephesus who met him at Troas that they should shepherd the flock over which the Holy Spirit made them overseers. The church was to be their flock and 2028 20, says he purchased it with his own blood. That tells me that the church was built by the death of our Savior. And as a matter of fact, once he went back to heaven, the church is always in the New Testament spoken as established. And the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the church. In Acts 2.47, the King James and the New King James reads, Praising God and having favor with all the people the Lord added to the church daily, those who were being saved. Now, most translations today read, similar to the New American Standard, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Some say, well, that number doesn't have to be the church. Well, let me read to you the renowned scholars' uh, words about this. Metzger states that the expression adding to their number signifies the union of the Christian body and perhaps could be rendered in church fellowship. He states, in the church is an equivalent phrase. And I might add that the later manuscripts that use the, the word church there in this verse is actually explanatory of the original words adding to their number. So the manuscripts that add to the church really is one of the earliest commentaries on the meaning of the expression. So yes, adding to their number is obviously adding them the same to the church. Now, how is the word church used in Scripture? Well, first, our English word church is very narrow in its meaning. You wouldn't call a city council meeting a church meeting, would you? Nor would you call a group assembled to enjoy a sporting event a church. So church is a very specific religious word used primarily in Christendom, right? You wouldn't call a Jewish synagogue a church, nor would you call a Muslim mosque a church. The word church actually travels back through several European languages to the Greek word kyriakon. That means the house of the Lord, which referred to the house of worship. This may explain why the first definition of the church in the English dictionary is the place of worship. So if we use the word church to refer to a building for worship, we are using it correctly according to Webster and the origin of the word. But it's quite confusing because the word church in the Bible is never used of a building. If we use house of the Lord as the family of the Lord, it certainly would convey a biblical idea. Our word church translates a widely familiar Greek word, ekklesia. I heard that word before I knew the difference between an alpha and omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Now let's look at that word, ekklesia. It's used actually 114 times in the New Testament. And when the Jews translated the Hebrew scriptures in Alexandria, in northern Africa, into Greek, they used this word 103 times. 
In the Bible of most Jews during Jesus and the Apostles' day was this Greek translation called the Septuagint. And it was translated from the Hebrew Bible between 250 and 150 BC, since most Jews couldn't read Hebrew at the time. When you look at the use in the Old Testament, the Greek word translated the Hebrew word kahal, and it's used of an assembly, a company, a congregation, an assembly for evil counsel, for civil affairs, for war, for invasion, for religious purposes, for feasts, fasts, and worship, a company of people such as those returning from exile, or a congregation as an organized body. And you know, the use of the New Testament in the New Testament is very similar to that of the Old Testament use in translating the Hebrew. It's used of secular civil assemblies, Acts 19, 32, verse 39, verse 41. It's used of the universal church, which includes all the born again, either in heaven now or on earth. When Paul related to the Philippians his past, in Philippians 3 and verse 6, he said he persecuted the church. Notice the church, singular, but he went into many places, many city, cities, churches, but he was inclusive. All these churches made up the church, the universal church. In Hebrews 12, 22, 23, we find that it includes those that are redeemed in heaven. But to you, but you have come to Mount Zion in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriad of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So that refers to the universal church, including not only those that are still living, but those that are passed on who were obviously part of the church. And so it's used of the universal church, of all the Christians combined. It is also used of a local church, such as the church in Corinth or Thessalonica. Read the first few verses of those particular letters in the first chapter. And of course, it is used of the collective Christians and or churches in a locality. For example, in Acts 9 and verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and continued to increase. We could say the church in America or the churches in America. The church would, be, would look at all the churches collectively and the churches would look at the whole individually. I hope that makes sense. The assembly for worship of Christians is also described as church. 1 Corinthians 14, 23, we discover if the whole church assembles together. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18, when you come together as a church, or you could say a congregation or an assembly, Often it is difficult to tell if the word refers to the congregation, the church family in an area, or the assembly for worship. And context must help us to see that. So what have we learned from this inductive study? The building is never called the church in the Bible. Churches were not denominations back then. There was just one church and the congregation or churches were in this one church. Conversely, a denomination is a religious organization united local, uh, uniting local congregations in a single legal and administrative body. Now, nowhere in the New Testament is there an administrative body ruling over 
the local congregation under its control. We have here the splintering off of a segment into a separate organization unauthorized by God and contrary to his will. And the establishment of an authority outside the local congregation that interferes with this business contrary to the word of God. But you know that most members of denominations do not know or care what their leaders really believe. They are pleased with the fine, uplifting worship service and the activities of the church. They may have a wonderful youth program or an amazing music program that makes them feel good. But as far as delving into the church's creed, they're not interested in that. They get what they're looking for. And that's all they care about. The sad thing about it is that they will ultimately follow that church's doctrine in many ways and in many facets of that doctrine uh, just by being there. But do you know that preachers in many denominations and many preachers in denominations today are timid to preach their creed? And if they do, they water it down lest they lose members, and losing members means losing contributions. In the conservative denominations, most of them teach predestination. This means that God has already determined before creation who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. No, and nothing will ever increase or decrease that number. Why would a holy God even allow those who will be lost even be born? Can you see how this paints God in a very bad light? But yet many people don't care. Some people who are living in sin have told me that God can never forgive them. And if I believed in predestination, I might agree with him. So in a sense, this doctrine can throw cold water on evangelism if one deeply believes in predestination. Let me say again, some of the largest conservative denominations and most of the conservative seminaries in this country teach Calvinism, predestination, once saved, always saved, and that sort of thing. Well, what is the church? Well, let me clarify a great misunderstanding that has been perpetuated by many preachers. The word ecclesia, translated church, does not mean the called out. Whatever its origin, the etym etymology of the word, it has never been used in extant Greek literature, Greek literature that is available for us to read, to mean called out. You may have had heard sermons, and I might have been one of them when I was young and didn't know any better. Something like this. The church in the Greek means the called out. It is made up of two words, ek and kalel, to call out. We are called out of the world and added to the church wherein is salvation. Now, I agree. We are all called out of the world and added to the church, which is the saved. But the word for church does not teach that. It focuses on where we are and not where we're from. And if anyone wants to read my published paper on this subject, just request a copy by emailing me at rredden, R-R-E-D-D-E-N, 604 at AOL.com, and I will send it to you at no charge. The church is the people, those who are gathered into the body of Christ, those who are saved and born again. 
It isn't an institution in a material sense, more like a living organism because the people is the church. In Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 likens the church to a body and our members of our body, Christians and Jesus being the head. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. In verse 27, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. So we can see, therefore, that we're talking about people. We're not talking about characteristics of the local congregation and saying that's the true church. The true church is the born-again, blood-saved Christian. The church is made up of those who are born again and baptized. You know, the church is also likened to a bride of that day who goes through the ritual of the wedding bath in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Let me read. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. F. Lagard Smith wrote a book on baptism, and he took this text as the basis of that book. There is an allusion to the ancient practice of brides preparing themselves for their wedding. The purity rituals of bathing were especially important. And so Smith called baptism the wedding ceremony. And that until the wedding ceremony, the couple may be engaged, but they're not married. Notice the tense, having cleansed her by washing of water with the word. Baptism is necessary for the bride of Christ, and each of us represents the bride, baptized believers. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, clearly states that we are baptized into one body, the church. For by one spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Notice here, it's by the Spirit or the teachings of the Spirit that guided us to the truth of being baptized in water into, body, into the body. This isn't Holy Spirit baptism. This isn't a spiritual baptism. It's by the agency of the Spirit that we were all baptized into one body. Ephesians 4 says there is one baptism. But if you have water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism, you have two baptisms. So the Holy Spirit baptism was only temporary, but water baptism was permanent. Notice through inspiration, the apostles taught others to be baptized. Acts 2.38, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of, the, uh, of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins or so that you may be forgiven. Being baptized in the name of Jesus places one into the body, which is the church. Nowhere do we find unbaptized members of the Lord's church. These two passages add to the significance of baptism as the entrance requirement into the Lord's church. Let me clarify, not baptism alone. Baptism is basically the final steps towards salvation. You've got to have things that precede it. You've got to believe in Jesus. You've got to repent of your sins. 
We need to confess Jesus as our Lord and remove any obstacle from baptism. We can't just say, be baptized and you'll be a member of the Lord's church. And a person not even believe in Jesus can go ahead and be baptized and that that water has power to save them. That's not the case. We are saved by grace. But yet that grace is based upon our willingness to come to Jesus through his will. You know, information today was common knowledge in the first century. Nobody disagreed with any, anything said. The Lord promised to build his church. And we learn today that what was spoken as future is always referred to as in existence following Jesus' ascension back to the Heavenly Father. Ten days after he ascended back to heaven, the church was born on Pentecost in Acts 2. The church is what people were added to when they were baptized, according to Acts 41 and Acts 4, uh, 2, 41 and verse 47. We've also learned that today that although the English dictionary defines church as a structure for Christian worship, the word church is not used in as a building in the New Testament. They didn't even have church buildings then. We also learned that the word never was used of denominations since they did not exist for hundreds and hundreds of years after the church was established. We also learned that the word church translates ecclesia, which means assembly or congregation. It can refer to a secular gathering of the church or the church. When it's used of the church, it is used in a few different ways. It refers to the universal church. It is used also of collective Christians over the world and those who have gone to heaven. It can refer to those Christians and churches in a certain locality, such as the churches, the church in America or the churches in America. It can refer to a local congregation, such as the one at Grover Beach, or in biblical times, the church in Rome, the church in Corinth, the church uh, in Ephesus. And finally, it can refer to Christians in a certain locality gathered together for worship. You know, going to church may fit the dictionary definition of the word church, but it isn't biblical. And besides, Christians, we are the church. The church is gathering for worship. When we say going to church, instead of we are going to worship, we sort of put some distance between us and, the, and our intention. Best to think of it biblically, when the church assembles for worship. We also learn that there are no unbaptized members of the Lord's church. Sometimes I hear people refer to someone who attached themselves to the church as members. If they haven't been baptized, they're visitors, not members. So we must be careful about the use of the word church and be careful how narrow we draw our circle for the church. We must understand if a person is born again into God's family, he or she is a member of the Lord's church, period. But what about you? Remember, Jesus saves the body, the church. The saved are added to the church. The local congregation or church is the visible representation of the universal invisible church. We cannot see every Christian the world over. Therefore, in a sense, it's invisible. But we can see the local congregation as being the visible representation of it. What we have said indicates then that we should go back to the New Testament and find there the pattern of the work, worship, and organization of the church to discover if it's a pattern or we have freedom to uh, drift away from that and do things our own way. We're going to address this next week, and we hope that you will listen to that lesson. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, help us to love the church 
as Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for it. Help us to understand that the church is the people, all those that are redeemed on this earth and those that are in heaven. And we're so thankful, dear God, that we can come together as a church and worship you as a Christian family, as a church family, and give you glory and praise and please you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for listening to this lesson. You may not have heard a lesson on the church in many, many years, and we hope that this has stimulated your interest for the lesson next week. And now I want to offer you an invitation to gather this Lord's Day and meet with your church family. And if not, find a Church of Christ in your community and visit it. You'll be an honored guest. Now I wish you all the best. May God bless you and keep you. Until we meet again, goodbye.